Welcome to Marketing Mash, brought to you by TheMarketingScope.com. Hi, I'm Eric Vidal with The Marketing Scope. Welcome to our CMO series. Today I have Ted Rubin with me, strategist, speaker, author, um, acting CMO of um, uh, brand, brand, brand Innovators. Excuse me. Um, today we're going to talk about the CMO and their relationship with other groups or other departments across the enterprise. Um, I was talking to you the other day and you said, the way you described it was kind of like the omni-channel in the enterprise. So what do you mean by that? Kind of give, give us a little bit of color. Well, first that. of all, I want to clear something up. Do we have to be screaming here, Eric? Like it sounds like you're really projecting. So I'm excited to be here with you too. We have microphones. I, I am I excited to be here with you too, but let's take it down a notch. Okay. And let's have a nice conversation okay. because uh, you know I want to bring the omni-channel approach to you and me, and yeah. let's work together. Perfect. So Perfect. really, you know, when I brought this topic up to you, it's something that interests me because there's a lot of conversation going on now about the topic of omni-channel marketing, and it's really important because there are so many different ways to reach the consumer that we have to take into consideration when we're working. But more importantly, they've got to speak to each other, work with each other. We've got to figure out attribution of who gets credit when something's sold across different channels. But a problem I see happening is the omni-channel conflicts within a company. So very few companies have a CMO that really has, in my opinion, broad enough oversight over everything that's happening with the company that has to do with internal culture, brand message, and then messaging yeah. out to, to your consumer, whether that be B2B or B2C, because it's all consumers, sure. to your employees, who to me have to be a part of that because number one, they're putting the message out and they're the face of the company. And number two is they can be your biggest advocates. So you want to make sure they're clear on that. Number three, your vendors, because you, you know, part of your brand is how you treat your vendors and you talk to everybody. And what I see are a lot of different silos yeah. And we're all familiar with that. So there's well, there's marketing. Yeah. Don't, give me a second here because yeah, yeah. you asked me a question. I'm going to finish it. You've got marketing. You've got communications PR. You've got HR. You've got customer service. And not only are those all going out in different directions, but I see a lot of competition among them. The same way you do in omni-channel marketing of who's getting credit for the sale. Yeah. No, no. It, it's, it's fragmented. Right. And it's also um, sometimes the messaging's off. Yes. Or the goals aren't the same. So there are, there are two issues here. Number one is, how do we all make sure we are sharing and, and pushing out the same metric mes message, culture, um, and, and outlook, number one, but also number two, how are we not internally competing with each other? And I see this a lot, and the way it first came to light for me is when we first met, you know, you were working with Dynamic Signal, and I'm on the advisory board there for the last couple of years, and they're an employee advocacy platform. Mm -hmm. And you know, employee advocacy is really starting to take off. But one of the challenges that all these companies have that are going into brands is that there are, even once the brand decides, yes, this is something we want to do, then there's an internal conflict of who owns it. Does marketing own it? Does comms own it? Does, does HR own it? And HR marketing says, hey, we own this. This is a marketing message. And we want to also, we want to be responsible for what we're putting yeah. out there. Comms it, wants to own it because they think they own communications. And HR thinks they own the employee. And then they end up fighting with each other for six working months, together. For six to nine At months least. to figure it out. No, right. I, I completely. Well, I mean, I did a, I did a, a video uh, a few months ago where we talked about um, your brand promise right. and the messaging architecture. And that usually comes from marketing. But good companies who do it well, do it right, um, and I talked about Target, and I talked about Google and some others, and even at WebEx, when I was at WebEx a few years ago, what we did is, well, quite a few years ago, um, we didn't just do it in marketing. It started in marketing, right. but then we, got, we brought a team and we brought some people in sales. We brought um, people in finance, actually. By the way, I'm glad you brought up sales, because that's really important, too. Yeah, sales, of course, because they're always customer-facing. Customer service, and we brought in a team of like 12 people to help work on that, what is that brand promise? What are, what are we promising our customers, our partners, our vendors every day? Right, and one of the places I see it most, okay, and I understand there's always a, a push-pull between marketing and sales, but you know, in essence, they both want the same thing. What, what, where I see the big the problem really surfacing a lot is with between customer service and marketing because there's total different reward systems and their end goals are really completely different. When it, truth be it, to me, customer service should be the ultimate marketing opportunity because somebody is calling you with a problem, and when someone calls you with a problem or when somebody wants something from you. They listen to every word that comes out of your mouth. Mm -hmm. So it's a tremendous opportunity 
to not only build your reputation, I like to say a brand is what you do, a reputation is what people remember and share, but it's an opportunity to have that, that time when they're hearing every word. As we know, most consumers block out most of what we're marketing to them, right? But here they're listening to every word. L let me ask you a question. So, obviously this makes sense to both of us. It, it probably makes, I hope it makes sense to a lot of the other marketers so. in, in the audience or who are listening in, but how do you bring it into the enterprise? How do you how do you make that change? Because you know, I mean, it's it's not easy to have a lot of these different disciplines funnel up, either report to the CMO or somehow dot line or work close. I mean, how do they how do these how do these C levels or execs work with the CMO, or how does the CMO work with them to be able to achieve that success? I, I can't tell you I have that problem solved. Um, you know, on the one hand, I'm a little bit prejudiced. Uh, to me, I believe that that should all report up to the CMO because I believe it's all messaging, it's all part of marketing, it's all part of building your company, getting people to want your products more, use your products more, share your products more, about the longevity of the customer, about the lifetime value of the customer. Uh, and I see it from that perspective. Now, that's not always a simple thing. A CEO can't just walk out one day and say, hey, changing the org chart, this is what's gonna happen. It has to be a gradual process. And to start that gradual process, process I think is about getting people to understand, really understand that they have to work together, not make a face to the public, not make a pronunciation. Look, a lot of leadership leads by making statements. This is what we're going to do. Yeah. But truth be told, leadership has, to, in my opinion, and this is just my opinion, has to get into the trenches. You, you, look, it's just like we say. You know, when I grew up, my dad a lot. Now, I respect my dad, and he was tremendous, and I learned a lot from him. But he, uh, what I heard come out of his mouth a lot was, do like I say, not like I do. And one of the things I've written a lot about, as, a, I, as part of my blog, I have a, dad, uh, a divorced dad section, and I write a lot about my daughters that I, what I try to preach them is, do like I do. Not like just like I say yeah. that I am going to demonstrate that, and and whenever I was in that kind of senior level position, and whenever I I ran my I wasn't always a CMO. I was a CEO. I ran some companies. I started some businesses. I always try to be the guy that would go in and do it myself. I was at a company called the Black Book, an old school advertising company that made source books for creatives and photographers. And when our books were late, I got into the warehouse and I packed books. And I can't tell you the kind of respect that garnered from from everybody down from the warehouse employees to the salespeople who had to get those books delivered yeah, yeah. because they weren't paid for until they were delivered and that's how they got their paychecks. And I just think that if you really want that to happen with your organization, the place it has to start yeah. is, is with your board and with your, and, and with your, with your CEO. You know, in, in, I'm a little prejudiced too and along those lines, I think you have a lot of companies in the Bay Area and Silicon Valley that are doing that. Startups, medium-sized companies where the CEOs are very hands-on and it creates a certain culture inside the company. Yes. I, I, they've been doing it for years. It creates a certain culture in the Bay Area. I mean, the CEOs, not all, but a lot, a big number are very hands-on and it spreads. And so now, now there's another there's a there's a there's a downside to that too. CEO owns the company, or the founder owns the company, has the most stock, has the most uh, has the most compensation, and he works 20 hour days, seven six seven days a week. And then his expectation is everybody needs to follow that. And yeah. that is where you have to you have to be careful. You have to get in there, do things, show people you're willing to do it, lead by example. But on the other hand, you have to remember that people are individuals. You have different groups of people. You have different comp levels of people, and you have to have, create different buy-in. And then you know, again, and we're going backwards a little bit here, away from what we're talking about, but then what I like to say is you have to empower your employees to power your brand. And that means making them better, not just to better the company, but to really care that I want Eric to leave this company better than when he joined it, not because it's gonna benefit my company necessarily, because it's gonna benefit Eric, and therefore I know it's gonna benefit my company. Yeah. And, and, and also, I'm trying to, to, to get that idea and share it with other companies so that the same thing's gonna happen when I get people from other companies, that they're gonna be people that come with an expectation of improving themselves and learning and having internal mentors. So back to our discussion about omnichannel uh, conflict within the company, and I think it really comes from the side of conflict to begin with, rather than we need to start looking at his ways, how do we all work together? How do we, how do we share attribution? How do, how do we stop worrying about who gets credit for that increase in sales? Whether it's marketing, comms, HR, well HR gets it because they hired better people and they manage them. Comms gets it because they're out there getting all the PR and earned media. No, marketing gets it because they're working hard and creating the message. Well, truth be told, in the end, sales gets it. Yeah. Because they're the guys out there on the front lines making the sales, but what we need to start in my eyes is start thinking about how do we create channels 
where everybody gets a piece of it all, feels like they're getting the same message. And part of that, I think, is, is the reporting structure. And part of it is the culture of the company and making it about everybody. And there's a lot of companies doing that now, that you get rewarded based on the overall performance of the company versus on just your own performance. I yeah. mean, you might get rate, you might get, you know, obviously internal raises, but bonus structures and, and, and other types of participation. I just think we, we need to think about it. I don't have the solution. What I'm saying is we need to start focusing on it. We need to start giving it some mind share of how do we stop that internal competition and turn it more strongly into internal collaboration. Let's get into a little bit more about examples or customers or companies that are, that are doing, it, doing it well, or at least they're on path, or they're doing something right. pretty close to what we're talking about. And obviously we, you know, we have to be careful of going too much in the ins and outs of different companies that, that we either work with or for, but can you give me a couple examples? Well, you know, it's also just not, without being aware, like most of the observation I do are from companies I work with, with a certain department, or I, I just observe from the outside. And so I can't really speak to their entire internal structure, but a couple of companies that I've seen do a great job with this are um, Walgreens. So I first, you know, witnessed this through their Dwayne Reed's subsidiary um, when I worked closely with them when I was a collective bias. And, you know, they really do a great job of combining um, PR comms and, and, and then the social part of it in, into the marketing side of things. The message is the same, the communication is very, very good, um, they care about the same thing, the reporting structure, I don't know what it is formally, but I saw it informally, was certainly in that direction. And, and they've just done a great job. They've built a, a, a great brand, they've built a great following, they've built a, a great um, customer voice. Um, they, I know their promoter score is great, their share of voice has increased dramatically. Yeah. Um, so they've done a great job. And then, you know, another company I talk about a lot is JetBlue. And again, without speaking about their formal structure, I just know that they're, what they've done is remarkable between their social, which is PR comms, you know, their, their customer service and their marketing. And the message has been completely united. It's been totally together. They, they are about the customer. And sure, they've had their glitches, and the truth of the matter is, between, like, say, 2007 and now, they've had their problems. They've, you know, like they're an airline, for God's sake. They're gonna have issues. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. it's a tough business to be in between consumers, between regulation, between weather, you know, everything else. And they've done a remarkable job of keeping their message on point, keeping their message unified, and keeping a great communication between their and, and working together between customer service, social PR, and marketing. And, and I've been I've been really impressed with it. And I've I've noticed that a lot of the airlines are trying to follow suit and do the same thing. Yeah, yeah. How well, about you? Well, you know, I'd be curious to know, like, do you have a, a company that you could say that you know is a bad example? <laughs> or, or hasn't done a good job of this? Yeah, I know a few. Uh, <laughs> you know, the, well, I shouldn't say bad example. Here's one. I mean, Cisco. Uh, they're a big company. They, they, they can handle it. They, you know, they're big boys over there. But, and, and I know that they're marketing now, over the last few months or so, they're going through some changes. So right. I think they're heading in the right direction. But you go back a little bit ago. Um, it, it was it was very broken up, and um, you know they're saying one thing over here. They're making great products. They have a great sales team, world class. They, they go through the channel heavily, but the marketing and the customer service and the support and the PR. It was a, it seemed like it was coming from five six different departments. To be right. honest with you, um, and so and also the other one was I mean it took them forever to get online. I mean they're not they're a technology company and. Most of their marketing and communications was through a TV and print. Right. It took them forever to get online. I still don't understand that one. Um, well, actually, I, I do, but I don't want to go into it. But anyway, so I, I think that's one. That's one example of a company that I think that um, it just wasn't. It wasn't coming from. It wasn't coming from one CMO or COO. A lot of companies it comes from the COO sometimes. Right. Apple maybe in the day it used to come from the CEO. Um, you know, Chambers was a magician. He was a just just a wonderful leader, it still is, but it just from the marketing standpoint, could have been better. And, you know, I, I, and I, like I said, I think they're on the right track, but historically the last few years, could have been better. Yeah, you know, I see it with, I, I see problems like that with retailers too. You know, especially with, with this whole omni-channel approach, like for instance, a, a Brookstone. Yeah. You know, it, it, it's, they've got one message going on in their store, they've got one message going on online. Half the time the inventory doesn't connect, even though it should. Different and, messages with the channel. Even, right, you know. and then they're telling you they're gonna take care of something and try to get them, they're out there on the social channels, but try to get them to communicate with you and it can be a nightmare. But then get someone on the line, you know, they're one of the companies, you get on, you, you make a complaint, all of a sudden you get a call from somebody offline 
and they want to fix something for you. And, and what they're doing is they're creating that, that mindset that has really pervaded social now that, or customer service that, hey, if you don't get satisfaction when you call the 800 number, just go to social, make enough noise, and then all of a sudden you'll get a call from somebody saying, let us fix it. And it shouldn't be that way. Yeah. They should be working together. If you go to social, it should be fed through to somebody that can handle your problem. If you call on the phone, they should be able to deal with that too. They shouldn't have to wait for that to happen. And again, this has to do with culture and message and different departments that are being rewarded different ways. Most customer service departments are rewarded for getting you off the phone fast. I mean, it, it's, it's still to this day, even with all the tools available, it's say no because 70% of the people will hang up yeah. and then you move through the queue quickly and it's about how quickly you get to the calls and how quickly you get to answer somebody and how quickly you move them along in the process. Yeah. By the way, this morning the company I was on a customer service call with, the, the, he wasn't measured on how long because he let me, I did, had to go find something. <laughs> he was very accommodating. Well, that's nice. Very accommodating. Um, um, hey, so I have a lot more questions. Okay. I know we have a lot more questions from the audience, but let's get to them first and okay. then I'll, I'll jump into some of mine. First, I just want to let you know, uh, I did want to wear, I wore my Dude, Ted Rubin Dude, looking good. Socks, so. Okay, so these are from Haley Forster Buyer. She runs Forster Inc. I, I spoke at an event for her and, well, I mean, check out these socks, man. Right. Except I can't figure out what everything is. Mine's Can more you? patriotic. Yours Can you figure more, out what these things are? Yours looks like a Jean-Michel Basquet painting kind of yeah. gone awry, but well, anyway, let's <laughs> wait, stay with us for a little bit. We're going to go to Q&A with Ted Rubin talking about uh, CMO issues and what have you. That's it for this episode of Marketing Mash. You can share your thoughts by following us on Twitter and Facebook. Subscribe to our podcast to keep up with the show. And of course, you can always find us by visiting themarketingscope.com.